Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. You know, we've made some significant gains with medicine and mental health. Researchers have systematically investigated the impact of numerous stress reduction techniques and validated their efficacy and their effectiveness, such that these strategies have now been determined to be evidence-based treatment approaches to include the neural and neuroendocrine mechanisms of stress. However, although we have these evidence-based efficacious psychopharmacological treatment options, the prescription of options still tends to play a minor role in psychological treatment. Here today to speak about the role of personal wellness as a foundation of one's health is a returning guest of my friend, Dr. Jerry Rodriguez Menendez. Jerry is the department chair of the MS Clinical Psychopharmacology Program at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. He is a licensed psychologist in Florida and a board certified psychologist with the American Board of Professional Psychology. He specializes in psychopharmacology, neuropsychology, and pediatric psychology. And currently he is a president of the American Academy of Clinical Psychology. Jerry is also the co-president and co-founder of Pinnacle Group, which provides business and leadership consulting. Hey, Jerry, welcome back to our show. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Graham. Very nice to be with you. Great to be with you. As we um, start out today, we're talking about wellness. Why is it that despite the research we have on the efficacy of these evidence-based stress reduction and wellness strategies, that the role of wellness still plays a pretty minor role in psychological treatment? It does, Graham, and it's kind of unfortunate. You know, I recall that I was giving a lecture on the history of the brain. And so then I went back to Egyptian times and then what was happening in Alexandrian medicine. And so then a physician at that time, you know, would tell you, well, you have to be careful with your diet, careful with how much you drink, you know, don't have more than two orgies a, a week, that type of thing. And then I was going flashback to like 2012 and I'm going to my own physician and he's telling me, you've got to be careful with your weight, you know, just basically the same things, you know, I, I see your cholesterol is going up a little bit and so forth, and you've got to exercise more. You're putting on more poundage. Actually, it turned out being that the best doctor I ever had was a ninth degree black belt who was my martial arts instructor because my cholesterol level plummeted, my blood pressure plummeted, my weight plummeted. So I then began looking at factors of health and actually I have a partner, Dr. Teresa Visu, and both of us were very interested in this. We have a consulting firm and uh, it's called the RA Pinnacle Group, but we began doing work with attorneys. And it was very interesting to find that, for example, in 2016, the American Bar Association, Commission on Lawyer Assistance, and the Betty Ford Foundation had a study with 13,000 currently practicing attorneys. Now, these are folks who have very good lifestyles for the most part in terms of socioeconomic status and in terms of their financial status. However, the study found that between 21 and 36% of currently practicing attorneys qualify as problem drinkers. 28% were struggling with depression, 19% with anxiety, and 23% with stress. And so then when we go to a physician, a physician is typically using the medical model And they're typically looking for absence of disease, but they're really not focused on wellness per se. So then uh, my partner and I began taking a look, well, what constitutes wellness? Mm -hmm. And naturally we do have a biopsychosocial model. Mm -hmm. And that model is particularly practiced in medicine. In psychology, we look at other factors And some practitioners really detest the biopsychosocial model, but the model is very rich if Mm -hmm. we look and break down the model into what it's actually saying. So we came up with eight basic dimensions of wellness that are based on that biopsychosocial model. In terms of the biology, 
just one factor is really associated with it, which is physical wellness. But then when we're looking at psychological wellness, we find that there are four factors that are involved, specifically our intellectual and cognitive wellness, our emotional wellness, and certainly our spiritual wellness. And then when we look at the social dimensions, we have four dimensions or, or four aspects, social wellness, financial wellness, occupational wellness and environmental wellness. Really so it, it's a, really a pleasure to break those down. You know, I appreciate you starting us out that way. Basically, we're talking about, hey, what if we take this biopsychosocial model that has been a nice framework, but it sounds like you're beginning to kind of tease some things out under each one of those headings and allowing us to see there's some rich things that we can take a look at. Let me start with a poll question for our listeners. How about that? You're talking about some factors that can influence health. So listeners, here's a poll question for you and think about the answer to this. Of the factors included below, I'm going to read them to you, which one has the highest influence on health status? Okay, so these are factors that influence one's health status. Number one, human biology. Number two, our environment. Number three, healthcare. And number four, life choices. Human biology, environment, healthcare, life choices. Which of these factors influence most one's health status? Jerry, give us the answer on this one. Which factor here is most influencing of our health status? And it's okay. our lifestyle choices. You know, it's far more important than our actually, our human biology. It's more important than environmental factors. It's more important than any other factor is how we live our lives mm -hmm. and the choices that we make. So when we look at the top 10 causes of mortality, and we begin with, for example, heart disease, cancer, right. we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you know, diabetes, all of these things tend to be associated with lifestyle choices that we make. Are we smoking? Are we eating too much? Are we engaging in a sedentary lifestyle? So as human beings, we have to remember that, yes, we have this intellect and a, a great a spiritual life as, as well. But physiologically, we are animals, you know, mm. we're not meant to be sitting down in a chair for 12 hours a day or eight hours a day, we're meant to, you know, be hiking, we're meant to be swimming, we meant to be running, right. but, you right. know, th that's the physiology of, of our body. You know what I like about this almost feels like there's a, you know, two sides of this coin on the one side. Lifestyle choices, and as you've broken it down, I've heard you share this before, human biology accounts for about 20%. The environment counts for about 19%. Healthcare, about 10%. Lifestyle choices, 51%. On the one side of the coin, for me, that is, wow, I've got some control over the things that I, I can really alter. What's my blood pressure, you know, my heart rate, my cholesterol, all of these things, my mental well-being, all of these things that I have control over, which I love. Lifestyle choices, I get to have more control. On the other side of that coin, and speak to this, it also requires some responsibility. Yes, very much so. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. And also, we are social animals. So we have to take a responsibility as well for our own communities. That's a good point. You know, as we're talking about this idea of wellness, we often think that wellness defined is this absence of being ill, or there's a dysfunction going on within us, or uh, I'm well because I'm happy. That's not necessarily the best way for us as we come into this. I want to talk about the eight dimensions you just mentioned here in a moment, but there's probably a better way for us to, to, to find wellness here. Define it for us in a way that you think is going to be an applicable definition. Well, I think that wellness is a state of physical, mental, and social well-being. You yeah. know, we talk about work-life balance, and in reality, life is rather unbalanced. And so then if we take, you know, into account these eight areas that have to do a lot with self-care, self-love, mm -hmm at the same time, then we can have a more fulfilling life. But it's not yeah. just absence of disease that constitutes wellness. It's how we feel about ourselves. Do we feel socially engaged? You know, there are many different factors that come into play. And that's why we've broken down the biopsychosocial model. Yeah. Because even when you speak with, say, clients or patients, 
you know, to say, oh, the biopsychosocial model, well, that doesn't mean anything to them. No. But if you can explain it in terms that they understand, yeah. now they have that, aha, okay, now I see what I need to do. That's what I love about your model. Now it makes it, you know, the biopsychosocial, that sounds good. And it kind of rolls off the tongue pretty nicely. But what do I do with it, you know, in each of those three? What you guys have done so nicely is you've kind of teased these apart and expanded upon what these eight dimensions are. If you would, name the eight dimensions for us and then select a few of them and share some insights that, about how they play out in our lives and how we can be intentional in working them into our lives for improved wellness. Certainly. Well, we've already mentioned the biological dimension and the biological aspect of wellness. And this is very interesting because there have now been two major studies in the United States. The Fremington Heart Study is one of those that have indicated that the prevalence and, and in the studies internationally that I'll describe, they've kind of confused prevalence with incidence. They use the terms almost interchangeably. But the incidence of dementia has gone down in the United States over the past 20 years by about 25%. That is huge. That is huge. Then they did international studies in England. They did them in the Netherlands, Italy, France, even in Africa. And they came up with the same result. Hmm. that dementia is decreasing by about 25%. The, the official was like anywhere between 24, 24%, but it was 24% was the, the figure. At any rate, what's important about this is that we do have responsibility. And one of the things that's thought to be most important is our heart health. Hmm. If we have better cardiovascular health, we reduce the chances of say stroke, from occurring, we greatly reduce the chance of dementia in that case, because a high proportion of dementia is due to vascular dementia. So it's very important then that we try to, to control these factors that can lead to degenerative diseases. The same thing with regards to cancer, the same thing with regards to heart disease. So if folks can exercise I tell them four times a week for a minimum of 40 minutes. And I see people walking around and that's great, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting in there and training, you know, yeah. really making sure that you have a good sweat, that you get yeah. your heart rate up is of critical importance. So in that biological aspect, just mm -hmm. doing exercise four times a week, reading your lab results so that you know what they mean and watching out for things such as your body mass index, such as metabolic disorder, which is a precursor to pre-diabetes, which is a precursor to diabetes. Yeah, they're, they're all connected, aren't they? You start with the one, but they, it trickles they down are. to, yeah. So the earlier you can catch this, right. the better. And if you just begin exercising, that by itself will reduce a lot of your medical issues that folks have. I like to say that exercise is the best medicine, yeah. hands down, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so we so, could do one thing, just one, just, just one, one of the eight, just and, start there, right? And really exercise is probably about the best antidepressant that there Absolutely. is as well. So for mild to moderate depression, exercise can be a real key in having a sense of wellness. Okay. Then when we go into the psychological dimension, there where what I would say first are intellectual and our cognitive health. And I mentioned that in terms of, we know that, and I, I don't wanna keep harping back to dementia, but we do know that dementia begins many years prior and that it's of essence that we remain engaged and that we remain engaged in things that we have a passion for. Think of the example that I gave you with the attorneys. Yes. You know, in terms of their nutrition, they're probably eating a lot more. They're certainly drinking a lot more than, than they should. But here, that absence of that psychological sense 
of well-being is causing destructive behaviors. And yeah. so then we have the ability to actualize or we have the, the ability to self-destruct. So we have to look at mindset in terms of cognitive factors. And you know, there's a lot of research by Carol Dweck that is from Stanford. So then she came out you know, with this book, which was the mindset of, or the psychology of success. Mm. And so then she talks about whether we have a closed mindset or an open mindset. And so then that tends to be very important as well in terms of, are we continuing to learn? Mm. One of my favorite quotes is by Michelangelo, who toward the end of his life said, I'm still learning, right? So when we talk about that ability for our psychological well-being, we certainly want to think of our capacity to remain open and to yeah. remain learning. We also think of the psychological factors in terms of stress management yes. and how we can actually teach ourselves to regulate stress. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with the factor of emotional wellness. And there's a lot being written there in terms of emotional IQ. You know, we talk about IQ or intellectual quotient, and that's pretty set for the most part. But for the, when you're talking about intellectual quotient, the EQ, right? this is, we can influence this. Oh, absolutely. You know, do we have standardized measures of EQ? Well, I haven't been able to really find any, but the concept is very important. Before we had words, we had our emotions. Mm -hmm. So our emotions are very deeply embedded in the brain itself. And you have it in terms of your higher cognitive facets, in terms of emotional regulation mm -hmm. uh, in the temporal cortex, for example, but you also have things like the reticular activating system. Yes. And, you know, emotions- Which influences are, what, Jerry? Tell our tell listeners, the reticular activating system, which- Well, it's system, go which... going to uh, uh, our alertness. Yes. And then our uh, states of arousal. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are impacted by our emotional state. So we're really yeah. talking about more primitive brain areas yeah. also impacting our emotion. And so then it's our prefrontal cortex that controls our limbic system, basically, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, the limbic system has been called our id. Yes. And the prefrontal cortex operates more like our ego. Right. Okay, so it gives the id what it wants, but in a socially appropriate manner. Gotcha. Okay, so the, the same thing occurs there. And there's an old theory around the 60s, but it's still useful in a conceptual sense, which is the McLean triune theory yes. saying, hey, we have a reptilian brain and sitting on top of that reptilian brain, you know, we have a paleo mammalian brain. And then on top of that, we have the new brain, right? The neo mammalian brain. And it's not exactly correct, but it is a good conceptual model for yeah. us to understand, hey, you know, we've got to be able to regulate these yes. very strong emotions that we have. So when we talk about emotional intelligence, we're basically talking about five factors. The first of which is our self-awareness. Mm -hmm. The second is our ability to regulate our emotions. The third has to do with our own motivation. And then the last two are actually social, empathy. Yes. Do I have that ability to place myself in the space of another individual? Yes. And then also we talk about social skills. Yes. Can I relate and connect with other individuals? So that yeah. has to do with emotional intelligence. So we have the biological dimension, the intellectual factors, emotional wellness per se. Yeah. And then we also have spiritual wellness that ends up being very important in that psychological dimension itself. Jerry, if I could kind of, kind of imprint on this with you, I, I really, really very much like the idea that 
our EQ is something that we can grow. We're not, you're not yes. born with it. And this, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not a nature thing. You either got it or you don't. It's something that we can develop. And what I love that you're breaking down, and I haven't quite thought about it like this, but I, I use emotional intelligence in my work. And, you know, I found, I think most people find that there's some really smart IQ people, very smart, you know, a lot of letters after the name, high positions, a lot of power, et cetera. But emotionally, a lot of them are developmentally arrested. And I believe that we're only as good as we're able to emotionally manage moments and come into these moments with some sophistication, self-awareness, other awareness. And so I want to go back over these, these for our listeners, this emotional intelligence is something we can grow. It involves self-awareness, our own self-regulation. What am I feeling? What am I needing? And Being can aware I aware of those feelings? Yes, exactly. And can I manage my response to those? That's a biological piece. Can I slow things down? And I want to talk about the the stress response in just a moment tied into this bio piece. But if I can understand what is it that I'm feeling, what am I needing? Can I self-regulate around that? What's my motivation underneath it? That's the third piece. And then can I hold those and then put myself in the other person's position and maybe get clear about what they're going through, what's happening. And then can I bring my self-awareness that I've got some regulation around and an empathic understanding and attunement of what they're going through. And can I bring these together in a way where we can kind of connect? I work sometimes with a model that says there's three ways we can try and work something out. We can act it out, think it out, or talk it out. If I'm upset with you, I might slam the door or turn into paper late, or I'm acting out my feelings, probably at a not very well self-aware level, and my self-regulation is not the best. Or I can think it out. I can ruminate. I can obsess. I guess, oh, that Jerry guy, you know, just he's, a, he's, a, he's not a nice guy. And I can, but both of those, nothing happens. In fact, it's going to make our relationship worse. Uh, it's going to impact things. If I'm, if I'm acting something out, you're going to be upset with me, but not know why I'm doing it. It's going to hurt our relationship. If I'm doing the, you know, the thinking out, it's like being in a rocking chair, you know, you're working really hard, but you're not going anywhere. I'm just ruminating and I'm stuck. But if I can bring it to a conversation level with this emotional intelligence at work, boy, I can put some great endings socially and relationally and for myself into these interactions, can I? That is absolutely the case. And, and you've really hit it on the head. Emotional intelligence is of fundamental importance in leadership. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I don't want to cross concepts, but, you know, I hope that our viewers will understand that human beings, before we were able to talk with one another, we communicated via grunts, via gestures, you know, so our emotions are so deeply embedded within us and lead to actions, which right. can be obviously regrettable, right? Yes. Or they can be very positive. Right. So in, in that sense, that ability to then be able to put our feelings into words and to express it appropriately is a key social skill. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Most of us spend more time at work than anywhere else doing anything else. So why not spend that time in a job you love? Introducing Triad's Jobs Marketplace, the only job site dedicated specifically to behavioral and mental health professionals. Featuring more than 1,000 open jobs from dozens of behavioral and mental health employers and searchable by location, professional field, employment type, specialization, and more. Jobs Marketplace helps you find your next career opportunity. Full-time, part-time, or gig time, make the most of your time. To access Jobs Marketplace, register for your free professional account at hellotriad.com slash bht. That's hellotriad.com slash BHT, and then click to Jobs Marketplace. If you're already a member of the Triad community, visit app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. That's app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. Visit us today and take your next career step tomorrow. Well, as you're talking about that, I'm, I want you to expand upon a little bit for us the elements of psychological stress, because you're talking about ways that we can positively respond to our emotions. And actually, there's a control component to this, which is the good news, to the stress reaction. And we, you're saying we can actually interrupt it or change our response to it. walk through the elements of the psychological stress and some of the sequence of these steps for us. 
Well, I think that when we're talking about stress, we do have a psychological component in that human beings try to make sense of what is happening to them and they will assign judgment, right? That right. judgment can be either positive or negative, but there's a very neurological aspect to stress. And so then folks know about the fight or flight response, right? So that is intended to be very adaptive, yes. but we have a secondary system. So we have the sympathetic nervous system, right? That activates that fight or flight response, but then we have a secondary system yeah. that's kind of a background modulator, if you yes. will. You know how sometimes you like to listen to music, but you don't like it real loud, right? You right. like it kind of low while you're doing your work so that you can think. So in the background, you have a secondary system, which is called the HPA system, and it's hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. And so then if this system stays on in the background, even though it is a secondary modulation system, it's going to activate the release of cortisol, adrenocorticotropic hormone causes the adrenal glands to then release cortisol. Yeah. Cortisol short span is very good because it does serve as a secondary mechanism for extended stress when we're in that fight or flight type of scenario. Think we of need the it. right. Think yeah. of the soldiers right now yeah. on the Ukraine border with Russia. You yeah. know they have a very real threat. It's not going to go away in a day or two. Yeah. So it's it's an extended period. So their HPA access is very very activated. The problem is that if there's no real threat and that HPA access stays activated, circulating cortisol, yeah. then down the road, it's going to have a very harmful impact to us. And some of these things that we're talking about, we're referring to as excitotoxicity that causes dysregulation. Right. And as you know, there are different theories, for example, of depression, monoamine hypothesis being one of the biggest, but why does it take four weeks for symptoms to begin to abate, yeah. right? So now we're thinking more in terms of excitotoxicity in the brain and how to modulate that, especially MDMA receptors and glutamate. Because if there's too much excitation in the brain, the brain is very sensitive to calcium and to sodium. And then what ends up happening is that we're weakening our neurons and our interconnections with those neurons. You're talking as well, it, along with the kind of the biological side of this, the neuropsychological side of this, that there are some ways, if we can understand what the stress response looks like, there's a stimulus, and then we apply a thought to it. I, I'd like you to kind of walk us through it and tell us why it's important to see it this way and how it actually allows us to have some control that we might not otherwise think we can particularly around the importance of making proper meaning and proper appraisal of what we're going through. Sure. This is kind of like uh, canon bard theory and, and that old argument of the chicken and egg. Right. So, you know, is it a threat that's making our knees knock, right? Or is it our mind that's making, you know, in response to the threat, making our knees knock? But basically you have a stimulus and then that generates a thought we tend to assign an emotion, a valence, whether it is positive or negative to that particular thought, which then leads to behavior. And the behavior in turn leads to a particular result or yeah. outcome. Now, one of the things that we try to uh, teach people with mindset and I think Margaret Thatcher put it beautifully. If you see the, the movie on Margaret Thatcher's life with Meryl oh. Streep, where she says, watch your thoughts because your thoughts become words. Watch your words because your words become actions. Watch your actions because your actions become behaviors and watch your behaviors because your behaviors become habits and your habits become your character. That's really good. That's really okay. good. So this is kind of like the same thing. It's a domino effect, one yeah. leading to another, depending on our psychological state, depending on our mindset, and depending on our ability to manage stress or right. emotional intelligence, right, to manage 
uh, stressful activities. So I always like to tell folks that, you know, it's not stress that kills us, but our reaction to stress that kills us. Yes. Yeah. Hans Selye was the individual who came up with that particular quote. And it's very true. So we teach E plus R equals O. What does that mean? Event. We cannot control the event. We know that bad things happen to good people. That, that's part of life. You know, life is not fair. We can't control the event, but we can control the response to the yeah. event. So E plus R plus response equals outcome. Very Generally good. speaking, especially when we're talking about, you know, that mild to, to, to moderate e events, right? There are certain things that, you know, you can't change. Yeah, I think that's such a key piece. You know, it, it, events happen. Someone cuts us off in traffic. Someone, you know, yes. responds kind of questionably in a, in, in a text. And we, we have a place to intervene there. We have a, a way to interrupt what we might just naturally automatically think and respond with that emotion around it. And then a subsequent behavior that may not be the right response. If we can just stop and pause, there was a, a program that I was working with where we would say, stop breathe, reflect, and choose. You know, I think back in the day, remember when we used to give people rubber bands and we would snap our wrists, kind of right. shock us out of that automated, you know, automatic nervous system response. I think we got sued, so we stopped have, giving people out rubber bands. But <laughs> nonetheless, that idea, if we can say to ourselves, stop, take a breath. Yes. And, and kind of and, and bring in the, you know, the parasympathetic, the para, para, paramedic, paramedics make things better. So let's use that part of our nervous system. Like you're saying, we have access to, let's <laughs> slow it down, take a breath, reflect what's going on. Oh, I'm upset or my emotions are kicking up, or this guy reminds me of the, you know, my past relationship or that, that person cut me off and whatever it may be, and then choose how I want to respond. I want to be in charge of my responses. And that's that, I think that's the maturity and emotional sophistication that you're saying we can bring into those moments. Very much so. That, that's a great point. And in fact, one of the things that, you know, we included in, in our model was spiritual wellness. Yes. And so then that's the, the third psychological factor. So we have biology first, then within the psychological dimension per se, we talk about intellectual cognitive wellness, emotional yeah. wellness, but then spiritual wellness. Why? because it's so important to engage in good stress management. Yeah. Sometimes we'll understand that as human beings, we also have a spiritual side to us. Some yes, of us do. tend to close the door on that spiritual side, but for others, they tend to be very religious. Mm -hmm. And then other individuals don't believe in organized religion, but they are spiritual. So one of the things that we really espouse with our clients is good stress management through meditation. And there are whole different aspects of how you can manage stress. Yeah. Poetry, music is a great way to manage stress. Going for a walk is a great way to manage stress. Calligraphy is a wonderful way. So there are ways to manage stress, mm -hmm. exercise in, included. But on the spiritual side, learning to turn down the volume of our thoughts and the frequency yeah. of our thoughts is very important. So learning to go from that constant beta state yeah. that our thinking brain is in into a more alpha state where we can be physiologically relaxed yeah. is a very important skill to learn. And meditation is a, a great way to do that. Because you focus on posture, breathing, and concentration. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to that aspect of mindfulness. I know that it, as a neuropsychologist, this particularly has to speak to you regarding the neural protective factors around this mindful attention. And in fact, that, that is the, the best way to, to put it is mindful attention. We hear Help us understand word, that. Yeah. mindfulness a, a lot, but as human beings, we have the capacity to project ourselves into the future or into the past. Mm -hmm. We have that ability to ruminate as you were talking about, to think of all sorts of different possibilities, different consequences, what might happen. Right. Well, that throws us into this state. It can throw us into a state of anxiety. 
yeah. right? Or at least uneasiness, so to speak. So then being able to calm our bodies physiologically, and I'm not, re- when I talk about true relaxation, I'm not talking about coming home, putting your feet up on an ottoman, you know, popping open a drip beer and watching some TV. That's vegetation. That is not relaxation. So when I'm talking about relaxation, it is being in the now, in the present, focusing your your attention. The Japanese have a beautiful saying, mind like water. And part of that, you'll notice that a calm body of water, you can see your reflection, right? But if you take a pebble and you drop it into that calm pool of water, it's going to create a ripple effect. Yeah. And pebble after pebble creates even more ripples. Well, the pebbles are like your thoughts. You know, you've got a clear perception, but Mm. we're so used to thinking that we think and we think and we think, and it's constantly distorting our perception. So it's very important then that we learn to calm our bodies and to kind of clear our mind. Now you're, you know, I don't think that you're ever going to reach that point for a solid 20 minutes where you don't have any thoughts, but you can reduce the number of thoughts. And the thing is not to fight it. You get a thought and it's like, you see it like a cloud coming by and then you just refocus your mind and you continue to, to meditate. And believe it or not, I've known Roman Catholic priests who practice Zen meditation for that particular reason. So we're not talking about religion per se, but we're talking about calming the mind. Now, what's the benefit of that? We're talking about neuroprotective factors. And in the last two decades of neuroscience research, what we've really learned a lot is that the brain is constantly changing Mm -hmm. in response to our environment. So that's why I was saying earlier, you know, if, and I gave the example of uh, attorneys, there is positive stress. There is stress that is tolerable. Mm-hmm. And then there is toxic stress. Yes. Okay. So if you, you have, you know, positive stress, that's like, you know, you need a little bit of stress to, in order to become motivated, to, to get alive. out of bed. I, yeah. Exactly. So when yeah. you're thinking on your way, going to work, man, I can't wait to get in there. Right. That's positive stress. Or yeah. when you're, you know, thinking, Hey, it's a big game. That's positive stress, kind of right? If you're zone. looking forward to right being you're in bad. the zone. On the other hand, when you have, you know, tolerable stress, that's when we see things like adjustment disorders, you know, it's mm-hmm. a stressor that, you know, the individual can cope with, but, you know, they're going to do much better once that stressor has been alleviated. So divorce, unemployment, those types of things. And God forbid, when you get double and triple whammies, right? Yes. Like a health scare. But then you have toxic stress. Yeah. And when people have toxic stress, we know that it affects neuronal functioning. And in fact, there's plenty of studies to look at the effects of toxic stress on children who have uh, been abused and who have had adverse childhood experiences. That's right. The the literature is very rich on CNS dysregulation and the impact of toxic stress in these individuals. The same thing occurs with all of us. But on the flip side of that, when we're talking about that positive stress aspect and we're talking about mindful attention, Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize and the category is physiology or medicine for her work on telomerase activity. And for our audience that may not know, at the end of our chromosomes, we have these caps called telomeres. And the thicker the telomere, the healthier the chromosome and the better the chance of cellular reduplication through a cellular division, right? So at this juncture, we know that we have more cells dying off than are being regenerated, you know, at our particular age, right? So 
Elizabeth Blackburn did this study and she found that individuals who engaged in mindful attention had thicker telomeres. So it is telling you that this is an indication that you'll have more cellular division, right? Meaning so longer cellular health. So good, yeah. Okay, so, and she did a very famous study, the UCLA study, and her subjects were meditators. So there is a lot of things that are in our control. It's not just our biology right. that we can do to impact positively our health. I want to talk about those good habits. And I know we're kind of getting near the end of our time, but you know, there are good habits and you talk about ways that we can engage in healthy routines. Just one more note around the meditation piece. You know, oftentimes folks think, oh, I can't meditate. I can't sit still for a while. And we, uh, we ran a group at the hospital where I was I kind of professionally grew up and we were working with a, a number of folks that were having heart related conditions. It was through the cardiac department. And we had a lot of type A people, not surprisingly, in the group. And we thought, well, let's teach them some meditation. Let's be quiet. Let's be still. It absolutely drove them crazy because they couldn't sit still. <laughs> so the idea of just sitting meditating, you know, in the lotus position, for some, they kind of go, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do meditation because I can't sit there. What we found, though, that was just as effective and more appropriate for them was moving meditation. Yes something in movement, whether it was, you know, a progressive relaxation, whether it was some, maybe some yoga they could do where they were in movement. There's a, there are those walking circles, you know, that you can do that. Yes. Just, you, 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 you pace and you walk, talk about for those that can't sit for periods of time. I, and, and I am in that group talk about just really quickly, just in one minute, moving meditation and how that can be beneficial to us. Well, there, there are different types. So for example, Qigong, is yes. breathing exercises that one can simply do. And you really can be anywhere in order to do that. And then of course you have, for example, Tai Chi Chuan, yes. which is a form of moving meditation. And so then where you are concentrated on your body and movements tend to be very circular in nature. And then the idea is also to coordinate the movement so that the movement will come to an end and then begin again. But it requires really great balance because you're doing this very slow, yeah. these movements, but you're moving your body in unison. So you're taking forward that aspect of mental calmness, that aspect of posture, which is very important in Tai Chi. And then that aspect of breathing, which is also very important. Yoga can be done the same way yes. in terms of a moving meditation. But what I like to really tell, tell people is that they have this idea of meditation, which is, you know, kind of like uh, some guy up in the Himalayas, yes, exactly. you know, in a temple or some. <laughs> so, and really you can meditate at your desk during the, the, the yes. day, you yes. know, uh, just maintain good body posture. But the other thing I will tell people, just simple breathing. Absolutely. There are breathing exercises that are hundreds mm -hmm. of years old that are intended for this purpose. Right. So I will teach what's referred to as first breathing and then second breathing. And it's coordinated breathing where one is using the entire span, right? But you're, you're coordinating that with your breath. Really good. Just simply bringing the hands out and then in and then back out is another breathing exercise. You can do it right at your desk. So you don't need incense. You don't need any special no. cushions. You don't no. need any special lighting. I like dim lighting, but you know, you don't need chanting or anything of the sort. You can do it anywhere, you know? Yeah. I really like that. I, uh, uh, I do some EMDR and I'll tell people if they like just to kind of relax and use the bilateral stimulation that we see, you know, with the, with the eye movements, we can also do with tapping. You can kind of hug yourself and just kind of give mm -hmm. your, you know, your arms a tap at one time, that bilateral, or you can be in a meeting and you could be tapping your, your knees one at a time while you breathe. Right. And no one's going to say, Hey, wait a minute. Are you breathing? You know? <laughs> yes, I am. The idea is that they can use that breathing with the tapping to kind of just 
reduce some of their stress levels and kind of that regulation being enhanced. Jerry, we're, we're coming home here and I want to talk about some resources in just a moment, but I want to give our, our listeners kind of some, maybe some takeaway, just a real applicable one. We're going to have some resources for our listeners to get a hold of Jerry, to find out more about the resource and all the dimensions he's talking about in this model. But Freud said that we need to love and we need to work. Mm-hmm. I think he missed the third one. I think we need to love. I think we need to work. I think we need to play hard. And so you're talking about, you, you talk about uh, how we can disengage from our work to enjoy life. And you talk about even a transition uh, from work to home. This is something sure. our listeners can even use tonight. Give us some suggestions of that transition and maybe even an evening routine that they could benefit from. Well, uh, first of all, I, I agree with, with that statement, you know, in the sense that human beings need love. If, if infants yeah. do not receive love, you know that they will die. become depressed and they'll suffer. I believe it's anaclytic depression, if I recall yes. correctly, and they will die. Yes. Ex- exactly. So the, the same way, you know, we, we would modernize Freud's statement, but our work is a very large part of our identity. Mm-hmm. You know, so in terms of general leadership, I like to tell people self family work. Mm. Okay, because the same principles extend to all different aspects of life. In that sense, I like to think of the three C's, which are first of all, congruence. So when I say congruence, I mean, being genuine, and we know about Rogerian therapy, the or theory, the importance of being able to look at our past experiences to see our strengths, to also be aware of our weaknesses and mm-hmm. to still love ourselves and be genuine human beings. So yeah. to be congruent, I would say then connection is very important that we feel that we are connected mind and body, but that we're also connected to others yeah, through our family relationships, through our work relationships, our other social relationships with friends. Very, very important. And then the third aspect is contribution, Mm. because it's not enough just to, you know, simply, okay, I'm okay. But if you recall, we live in communities, and I said that we're social animals, so we need to contribute. You know, parents want to leave the world a better place for their children, and they want to give their kids more opportunities than they had. So in that sense, that's where we really bring in social wellness as well in the sense of being engaged with our communities. And we also have environmental wellness because we understand that our resources are finite and that we have to take care of Mother Earth if Mother Earth is going to be around for, you know, our descendants. So I would, you know, take Freud's statement of love and work, and I would add, you know, put the three C's, which again, congruence, connection, and contribution, you know, feeling that we are contributing to something greater than ourselves. Yeah, really good. Really good. Hey, Jerry, we're, uh, as we are coming home right now, just to wind this down, give us some resources that you might encourage folks in this wellness as a foundation of one's health in their life. Give us some resources our listeners could benefit from and also some information about you and how they can connect with you. Well, certainly, Graham, and thank you. Actually, your listeners will be provided with the Wellness Worksheets 12th edition by Incel and Roth. And this is a treasure trove. It's 295 pages, fairly recent, 2012. And so then it will you know, talk to you about aspects of stress, psychological well-being as well, exercise for health and fitness, weight management, when we were talking about things such as BMI, cardiovascular health, facts on cancer and Mm. the like, and then conventional and complementary medicine. And then it takes you through aging and dying and death. So in that it's sense, very comprehensive. It's yeah, it's very good. comprehensive. Yeah, it is. That's wonderful. How about if people want to get in touch with you and Teresa as well, your lovely well, wife? Well, if, if they want to get in touch with me or my better half, it's very <laughs> easy. Our website is the rapinnaclegroup.com. 
And I can be reached at grodriguez at rapinnaclegroup.com. Fantastic. Wellness is a foundation of our, of our lives. I uh, certainly appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's always nice to have you on the show. It was wonderful, Graham. Thank you so much for helping me share this most important topic. I appreciate it. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Jerry and me today. It's always great to have you with us. And I want to remind you that this episode, its resources that Jerry was giving us, and all our other shows, as a matter of fact, can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash bht. So check out our webpage, triadhq.com slash bht, and explore our archive of podcasts and resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we will look forward to having you with us next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.